Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this special symposium on medical humanities, a symposium which will truly transcend all boundaries because we will be looking at humanities, social sciences, and arts, and in their application in medicine. And to do so with me today is my co-chair, Dr. Shehan De Silva, and I'm Chandani Vanigatunga. And we have three eminent speakers who will be sharing their insight on three different types of arts, music, the, uh, cinema, and books or novels sharing an individual's experience. So without much ado, let me introduce the first speaker to you. Uh, that's Dr. Arusha Disanayaka, no stranger to any of you. He's a senior lecturer in medicine at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Ruhuna. And Arusha will be talking to us on the topic, the answer my friend, inspiration from music, or vexing queries. Over to you, Arusha. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairperson, uh, for that kind introduction. May I uh, thank the College of Physicians, firstly, for inviting me to give this talk, and secondly, for organizing this symposium on medical humanities, uh, a very bold and a non-traditional uh, step that the CP, CP has taken, and because there is increasing recognition that medical humanities will help us become much better doctors. Right. I'm going to speak to you about a song which inspired me. Uh, it's Blowing in the Wind by Bob Dylan. It was a song which he wrote in 1962 as a 20-year-old. And it is said that writing the song took him only 10 minutes. He borrowed a melody from a slave-era folk song. And then we must remember the recall the background in which he wrote this song. That was the time that the Vietnam War was raging. That was the time in which there were different civil rights movements, the black, the African American movement, the Latin American rights movement, the indigenous Indian rights movement, the women's rights movements, the gay rights movements. So that's the time that all these rights movements were forging ahead. In this song, Dylan asks a series of fierce poetic questions from the society. Many say that it's the greatest protest song ever written, ever sung. Of course, when Dylan was asked, he said, I don't know what a protest song is. I had no idea of writing such a song. I just wrote a song. It's considered a progressive anthem, suggesting that all things must and will change one day. Uh, in 2016, Bob Dylan was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. The very first time a pure songwriter had been awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. There are some who say uh, Rabindranath Tagore did get the Nobel Prize in 1913, but to describe Tagore as a songwriter would perhaps be rather unkind. He was a lot more. To start my presentation, may I invite a third year medical student from the Ruhuna Medical Faculty, Kavindu Morayas, to sing the song which has inspired me. Kavindu. Oh. 
Thank you, Kavindu. So that, the song was set in a mix of rock and roll and folk music. It was set in 4-4 time, but Dylan deliberately saw, sang this song in a very slow tempo. He had a reason for that. The only instruments he used in this song were the acoustic guitar and the harmonium. He had a reason for that as well. The slow tempo, he tells us to slow down. All of us are rushing rapidly in life. We do not have time to look around us, to look at fellow human beings, because we are forever in a rush to finish things. Dylan wanted us to slow down. Dylan used only these two simple instruments because he wanted to tell us that we walk this world alone. We should not think as groups, but as individual human beings and find our own truth in life. Let's look at the stanzas. How many roads must a man walk down before you can call him a man? There were many who propagated the idea that to become a man, you had to serve the military, go to war, and perhaps kill or maim people. Then you became a man. Dylan questions whether you got to do all that to be a man, whether you can be a man without harming other human beings. Again, the protest movements had to walk long roads for long years without any success till finally they won the day. That's why he speaks about how many roads must a man walk down before you can call him a man. How many seas must a white dove sail before she sleeps in the sand? The white dove is a reference in the Bible in the Old Testament, Noah flooded the earth and then sent out the doves to look for land. Even today, the white dove is a symbol of peace. Dylan asks us, how many wars have we got to pass before we see that land of peace? How many times must the cannonballs fly before they are forever banned? If there were no guns tomorrow. There would be no wars tomorrow. We may never come to realize the folly of cannonballs. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. How many times... Sorry. 
How many years can a mountain exist before it's washed to the sea? A mountain simplifies, signifies resistance to change. A mountain is the cultural and the social baggage of a ideology that we carry. How many years does it take for us to change our thinking? Mountains, however strong they are, ultimately one fine day get washed away to the sea. How many years must some people exist before they are allowed to be free? He was speaking at that time about the African-American movement or the indigenous Indian movement. Even today, there are suppressed communities who are not allowed to be free in the world. How many times can a man turn his head and pretend that he just doesn't see? We walk so rapidly, seeing only our red carpet, our glory at the end. If we were to slow down and look around, we would see other people's suffering. At times we see, but we pretend we do not see. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. How many times can a man look up before he sees the sky? Again, the slaves and people who are enslaved in their minds are not permitted to look up to see the truth because their masters or their rulers have set limits to what they are permitted to think, permitted to see in life. How many years must one person have before he can hear people cry? How many times do we turn away? We pretend we do not see. We pretend we do not hear other people crying. Either we willingly ignore that or we are in such a rush looking after our own affairs, we forget. How many deaths will it take till he knows that too many people have died? Too many people died in 1971 in Sri Lanka, in 1988 in Sri Lanka, during the 30 year civil war in Sri Lanka. Even if there is going to be another conflict, again, too many people will die and we will not realize that until everybody has died. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. So people asked Dylan, what's this cryptic phrase? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the What does that mean? Dylan simply told him, them, look, I'm only 20 years. I don't know. You all are the ones who have lived much longer. You all are the people who have seen how the world is. You should know by now. I do not know to tell you. And many believe that what Dylan actually meant was, winds come, winds go. Winds bring different things, good and bad, to the society. When it brings in problems, in the wind fly small scraps of paper or small feathers on which are written the answers to the problems. When the wind ceases, they fall to the ground. A few sensitive, receptive people pick them up, find the answer. Other people do not know. The next time there is a wind, it blows, it gets blown away again. The few people will change their lives when they see the answers. Now this song has inspired me as a human being. Does it inspire me and my work as a doctor? What is the social responsibility of a doctor? Just like Dylan did to the society at large, I am asking, I am posing a few fierce questions to those in the audience as well. Should doctors engage in public advocacy? That is advocacy on improvement of broader conditions that improve health. For instance, 
when we treat a child after a traffic injury who was not wearing a seat belt, is our duty over when we treat the child? Do we have a role to play an advocacy in the use of seat belts to make things better? I ask you, do we have a role? Are we uniquely placed in the society to address difficult issues? A few years ago, there was a huge crisis in Sri Lanka because of this fertility pill rumor, Vandapeti rumor, that one community was trying to make another community infertile or subfertile. I remember a few doctors got together, did an extreme literature search, and then on their own released, uh, made press releases as well as called a news conference and said that there is absolutely no evidence to say that such a pill exists. And that helped calm down the society's fears. If that had come from anybody else, the society would not have believed. But because it came from eminent medical people, because they advocated for a peaceful society, people, the, the country survived that moment. Of course, the easy way out to take is to align ourselves with a political party and hope that the political party will do the public advocacy and do good for the society. Since independence, we have seen that that just doesn't work. So it's time that we ask ourselves whether we leave it to our political masters or we do it ourselves. Do we have an advocacy role, I ask you, in social determinants of health, reducing poverty, reducing inequity, reducing the impact of climate change, provision of clean air, water, safe housing, freedom from violence, protecting and promoting human rights. The problem here is we as doctors, we have our own biases as well. Therefore, to play a constructive social advocacy role, we will first have to conquer ourselves, to look inwards to see what biases we hold within us, and then we go ahead. A golden moment is, is, is even present at this moment. I was thinking there is a controversy whether COVID-19 victims should be permitted to be cremated or buried, whether they can be permitted to be buried. Who are the decision makers? It is the extreme religious organizations and the extreme others who are giving their opinion. Should our social advocacy role take us to appoint a task force, look at the evidence scientifically and give guidance on what is correct or not. I myself do not know the answer, but perhaps we have to take on issues of that nature. Do we teach social responsibilities of doctors in medical schools? Uh, this is an interesting uh, oath which I came across from the United Kingdom, from the Imperial College of Medicine. Some medical graduates back in around about 2000 had published this in the BMJ because they took it. They took this oath. I will not permit considerations of gender, race, religion, political affiliation, sexual orientation, nationality, or social standing to influence my duty of care. I will oppose policies in breach of human rights, will not participate in them. I will strive to change laws that are contrary to my profession's ethics and will work towards a fairer distribution of health resources. Ladies and gentlemen, this did not origin from the academics of Imperial College, but this originated from the medical students themselves. I've had the opportunity to briefly glance at the SLMC subject benchmark statement in medicine. I've looked at the graduate profiles of the Colombo Medical Faculty and the Ruhuna Medical Faculty where I teach. Of course, we talk about community medicine, you know, 
going to the community and practicing medicine. But I think it's perhaps time for us to more explicitly state what our social role as doctors will be. What is the role of medical professionals, professional organizations in social advocacy? This is a statement from the American Medical Association which appeared just three days ago. Three days ago, the AMA declared racism to be a public health threat and adopted a policy to address it. Perhaps because of the recent happenings in the U US that may have prompted that. But it's very heartening to know that the premier medical organization in the world has actually taken a very bold step to declare racism is a public health threat and adopted a policy to counter that. It's time, ladies and gentlemen, that we also start reflecting, even as professional colleges and professional organizations, what our social responsibility, social advocacy role should be. I wish to conclude my presentation um, asking you, what more is medicine than a social contract with humanity? And as Bob Dylan said, man's greatest inhumanity to man is indifference, turning your eyes and ears away. To conclude this presentation, may I invite Kavindu to sing Blowing in the Wind again. And then may I also invite all of you to sing this song along with uh, Kavindu so that we all feel what Dylan felt at that moment, and perhaps reflect on our inner social responsibilities. Kavindu.
very much. Thank you, Kavi. Thank you very much, Arosha, for that very interesting and thought-provoking lecture. Let's hope that we'll have all the answers blowing in the wind and we'll be receptive to receiving them. Uh, the College of Physicians has a small token of appreciation. Arosha, would you mind coming back on stage? And I'll invite my co-chair, Shehan, to hand over the uh, certificate of appreciation. From music, we move on to literature, and we are privileged to have with us Professor Diniti Fernando, professor in the Department of Physiology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. He's also a specialist physician, no stranger to the College of Physicians. And I'm sure that uh, talk on the final chapter, a revelation from a life-changing book, and we hope that it may be a life-changing book to us as well. Thank you, Chairperson. In the next 20 minutes, I'm going to share with you some thoughts on a life-changing book that I have come to treasure. This book, titled When Breath Becomes Air, was published in 2016 and was shortlisted in 2017 for the Pulitzer Prize in Biography. It's a reflective memoir and a partial autobiography of its author, Dr. Paul Kalanidi. The book is in two parts, and the first part is titled In Perfect Health, I Begin, where the author writes about his childhood and university days. Paul Sudhir Arul Kalanidi is the middle child of a migrant South Indian family of three boys living in New York during his childhood. His father is a cardiologist and mother a physiologist who gives up her career to take care of her family full time. When Paul is 10, the family moves from New York to Kingman, a remote town in Arizona, where his father is able to establish a regional cardiology practice. In the opening chapter, Paul engages the reader with this description of his busy dad, his adult words flavored with the candor of his 10-year-old self. My father had reached some compromise in his mind that fatherhood could be distilled. Short, concentrated, but sincere burst of high intensity could equal whatever it was that the other fathers did. All I knew was, if that was the price of medicine, it was simply too high. Undeterred by the impoverished school system in Kingman, Paul, Paul's mom gets down a college prep reading list for literature and gets the boys reading. She herself has not read many of these. Paul becomes a voracious reader reading Sartre, Voltaire, and many others at the tender age of 12. Paul writes about his obsession for reading. She made me read 1984 when I was 10 years old. I was scandalized by the sex, but it also instilled in me a deep love of and care for language. Some left more of a mark than the others. Brave New World founded my nascent moral philosophy and became the subject of my college admissions essay in which I argued that happiness was not the point of life. Hamlet bore me through a thousand times through the usual adolescent crisis. To his coy mistress and other romantic poems led me and my friends on various joyful misadventures throughout the high school. Paul does superbly well in high school and is driven by a desire to find a link between the meaning of human life, which his encounters with literature so richly described, and the neurobiological basis of it. This desire drives him to study human biology and neurosciences and literature at Stanford. He pursues literature further 
and for his MA thesis, he chooses to study the works of Walt Whitman, who is known as the greatest poet in America. His thesis is well received, but as he finishes his thesis, he is convinced that he does not want to pursue a career in literature, which he perceives at this point to be a subject that is overly political and averse to science. He decides to study medicine because by now he is convinced that it is only by practicing medicine that he could pursue a serious biological philosophy on the meaning of life and human connections that people are desperate for. And in the 18 months before he's admitted to medical school, he also earns an MPhil in the history and philosophy of science and medicine. Fast forward to his fourth year in Yale School of Medicine, and Paul chooses his specialty. He watches as his friends choose less demanding specialities in his words, the idealism of their med school application essays lost or tempered. He himself is fascinated by neurosurgery, he says, because of its unforgiving call to perfection. He sees neurosurgeons as masters of many fields and believes perhaps he too could join the ranks of polymaths in Stanford in a few more years to come. Next, we see Paul in his residence years, working hard, sometimes 100 hours a week. He's continually exposed to suffering, disability, and death, but he loves his work and is fully committed. He sees that not everyone can stand the pressure. On hearing the devastating news of his friend Jeff, a surgical resident taking his own life after one of his patient, patients dies of a surgical complication, Paul reflects about the enormous responsibility he has undertaken to not only preserve life, but to preserve the identity of his patients, knowing very well that death eventually comes to everyone. These are his beautiful words of reflection. The secret is to know that the deck is stacked, that you will lose, that your hands or judgment will slip, and yet still struggle to win for your patience. You can't ever reach perfection, but you can believe in an asymptote toward which you are ceaselessly striving. As a resident, his highest ideal becomes not saving lives, but guiding a patient or family to an understanding of death and illness. And in his deep words, when a patient comes with a fatal head bleed, that first conversation with a neurosurgeon may forever color how the family members remember the death from a peaceful letting go, maybe it was his time, to an open sore of regret. Those doctors didn't even listen. When there is no place for the scalpel, words are the surgeon's only tool. Paul reaches the pinnacle of his residency in the sixth year, becoming the chief neurosurgery resident in Stanford. He had mastered all the cooperations and he's in the middle of a postdoctoral fellowship in neuroscience. His research had won the highest awards for neurosurgery in the US and he's tipped to get hired for a coveted professorial position in Stanford itself. And he feels that finally his life's philosophy is falling into place. The first part of the book ends there and then we come to the second part title, Seize Not Until Death. The first chapter of the second part finds Paul lying in a hospital bed, embracing his wife Lucy, both of them crying. A lifetime non-smoker, Paul has just been diagnosed with stage four lung cancer with bone and liver metastasis. Paul is devastated and lost. His carefully planned and hard-won future is shattered before his own eyes. The experience of having treated so many patients and being with them through their sufferings does not help him at this moment to deal with his own illness. Paul meets his oncologist Emma and plans for chemotherapy. He admires Emma and builds up an instant comradeship with her and respects her for asserting her role as the doctor who is responsible for him. He suffers from side effects but becomes better clinically. Despite his repeated requests, Emma refuses to discuss Kaplan mere survival curves 
and refuses to give him a number for how much time is left for him. He understands that like his patients, he alone has to face his mortality and he has to decide what he wants to do in the remaining time. Paul and Lucy decide to have a baby. In search of hope, he turns back to literature again. He writes, and so it was literature that brought me back to life during this time. I woke up in pain, facing another day. No project beyond breakfast seemed tenable. I can't go on, I thought. And immediately, its antiphon responded, completing Samuel Beckett's seven words. I got out of the bed and took a step forward, repeating the phrase over and over. I can't go on, I'll go on. That morning, he makes the decision to go back to operating and focuses on physiotherapy and strength building to endure long hours of neurosurgery. He resumes neurosurgery and he is grateful to Emma for protecting his ability to form a new identity, although she is unable to give him back his old one. And he says, possibly in appreciation of Emma, what, I did, what did I want? I didn't know. But if I did not know what I wanted, I had learned something. Something not found in Hippocrates, Maimonides, or Osler. The physician's duty is not to stave off death or return patients to their old lives, but to take into our arms a patient and family whose lives have disintegrated and work until they can stand up and face and make sense of their own existence. Then his cancer returns and he gives up neurosurgery. Emma supports him in the decision and they decide on chemotherapy once again. Paul and Lucy's daughter, Katie, is born during this time. Paul writes, in spite of his waning strength and his memoir ends with a note he writes to eight month old Katie. Paul to Katie, do not, I pray, discount that you filled a dying man's day with a joy unknown to me in all my prior years. A joy that does not hunger for more and more, but rests satisfied. In this time, right now, that is an enormous thing. The book ends with an epilogue by his wife, Lucy Kalanidi, an internist herself. In her epilogue, Lucy Kalanidi writes, Paul was proud of this book which was a culmination of his love for literature. When he emailed his best friend in May 2013 to inform him that he had terminal cancer, he wrote, the good news is I've already outlived two Brontes, Keats and Stephen Crane. The bad news is I haven't written anything. Paul dies in March 2015 at the age of 37 years, two years after the diagnosis. Lucy ends the book like this. For much of his life, Paul wondered about death and whether he could face it with integrity. In the end, his answer was yes. I was his wife and a witness. This picture is from Scope, the blog of Stanford Medicine, published in April 2020. It was taken early this year before the pandemic hit the US and it shows Lucy embracing five-year-old Katie reclining against Paul's tombstone. She continues to speak about her husband at public events and she keeps Paul's memory alive. Looking for wisdom in another's words and experience is something that we often do. But I doubt whether Paul Kalanidhi was ever aware of the magnitude of the gift he was going to bestow upon his readers. As doctors, we are aware now more than ever of the cultural differences of breaking bad news, facing and accepting death and handling grief. And we have come to accept the need of cultural competence. But I believe that the gift of Paul Kalanidhi's wisdom transcends cultural boundaries. And if allowed, we'll connect the minds of healthcare workers all over the world in their quest to alleviate suffering. Though written in a graceful and elegant language, which is perhaps unique to himself, 
the wisdom of Paul, the wisdom Paul imparts is brutally honest, down to earth, and common to the core values we have come to accept, not only as doctors, but as the bigger human race. So what has this book revealed to me? Paul's words have validated my own experience of how coming to terms with mortality, be it your own or your loved one, is particularly hard for a doctor. I'm not saying it's less harder for others, but for a doctor, this is the moment when the finality of his own science makes the infinite dimensions of hope definable and terminable. And that can feel like betrayal, that can feel like failure, that can feel like guilt. Not only that, it is particularly hard for the physician who is treating one's colleague because his own science has no answers for both of them. But then again, during these confusing moments, it is often not the technical excellence that we will look for from our doctor colleagues. We will most likely be looking for comfort and them understanding our emotions and guiding us through the difficult terrain. We owe that to each other. I'm quoting from the latter part of the book when Paul meets the oncologist for the last lap of his treatment when the disease strikes again. Once again, I had traversed the line from doctor to patient, from actor to be acted upon, from subject to direct object. What I had come for was not a treatment plan. I had read enough to the medical ways forward, but the comfort of oracular wisdom. This book has revealed to me a great physician whose words consolidate the truth of uncertainties of human existence that our science can neither explain nor predict. And a physician who was generous and brave enough to tell us through his own terminal illness that without, without its art, our science is as dry as a bone, at least when it comes to the final chapter. These are my favorite quotes from his book. We build scientific theories to organize and manipulate the world, to reduce phenomena into manageable units. Science is based on reproducibility and manufactured objectivity. As strong as that makes its ability to generate claims about matter and energy, it also makes scientific knowledge inapplicable to the existential, visceral nature of human life, which is unique and subjective and unpredictable. In his seminal book titled, How We Die, Dr. Sherwin B. Newland makes a very interesting observation about our reaction to discussing death. We hide our faces from its face, but still we spread our fingers just a little bit because there is something in us that cannot resist a peak. Paul refers to this book in his memoir. The 18th century writer Lawrence Stern said that writing is but a different name for conversation. During my many conversations with this book and my many peaks, secret peaks at dying and death, I have pondered on the aspects of a good death, which I want to have, though the definition of it remains still incomplete for me. I have pondered on the how and why when faced with a terminal illness that some people face dying and death with adjustment and acceptance while most others do not progress beyond the face of denial. I have pondered on why in spite of the growth of the disciplines of bioethics and professionalism and the increased focus on these aspects during the training of medical practitioners, the experience for the person dying and the loved ones has remained largely the same over the years, not only in our resource poor settings, but also in the best facilities in the world. Ars moriendi is the Latin term coined in the 15th century for the art of dying. Which version of Ars moriendi will I choose given the chance? A modern, sanitized, heroic version or an old fashioned, basic, unassuming version or something entirely different? I don't know. What would I tell my patients and their families when they ask me about these options? The book has left me with more questions than answers and a hunger to seek. But what? 
what more can you ask of a book? I do not know whether it is a twist of fate or whether it is mere coincidence that I had to read this book that had probed my conscience as a doctor so deeply several times during this year and present it to others at many different occasions, including this conference today. This year has been extraordinary to the human inhabitants of the earth. We, the uncontested rulers of the planet, have been humbled and made vulnerable beyond our craziest imaginations. At least at the beginning of the pandemic, the once all-powerful members of the medical fraternity across the world were like bewildered lifeguards who had been forced to jump into a dark, icy cold maelstrom of unknown depth without any protecting equipment to save a drowning person. Some of those lifeguards who answered the voice of their conscience took the jump willingly and made the ultimate sacrifice. The others who were more fortunate learned to be safe because of them. Allow me to borrow Paul Cincy and writer's voice to pay tribute to my colleagues who are in the front lines of the battle today, serving quietly without passing judgment, without passing the blame, falling and failing at times, but rising about their own fallibilities. Paul reminisces about a patient after a spinal surgery. A truculent vet refused the advice and coaxing of doctors. As a result, his backbone broke down, just as we had warned him it would. Called out of the OR, I stitched his dehiscent wound as he yelped in pain, telling myself he'd had it coming. Nobody has it coming. I took meager solace in knowing that William Carlos Williams and Richard Selzer had confessed to doing worse, and I saw to do better. William Carlos Williams and Richard Sales, are American doctors, one a surgeon and, another a, and the other a physician, and both prolific authors, and they have written their biographies. This is Professor Abraham Verghese of Stanford University Medical School, a senior colleague of Professor Paul Kalanidi. Paul invited him to write the foreword for his book. This is the Stanford University Chapel where Paul's funeral service was held and Abraham Verghese attended the service. I'm going to end this talk by quoting Abraham Verghese in his foreword on how he felt at the funeral service. Because like Professor Verghese, I do not want you to go away with the idea that Paul's life is a tragedy. His loss was sad, but I believe his short life is victorious than many who live longer in the words of Professor Verghese. There was further meaning residing in this gathering where we slaked our thirst, fed our bodies, and talked with complete strangers to whom we were intimately connected through Paul. But it was only when I received the pages that you now hold in your hands that I felt I had finally come to know him. I confess I felt inadequate. There was an honesty, a truth in the writing that took my breath away. In a world of asynchronous communication, stop and experience this dialogue with my young departed colleague, now ageless and extant in memory. Listen to Paul in the silences between his words. Listen to what you have to say back. Therein lies his message. I got it. I hope you experience it. It is a gift. Thank you all for your patient hearing. It was truly an honor to be here today. Thank you, Madam, for that wonderful uh, uh, delivery of uh, uh, your life-changing approach uh, on this book that you read. And uh, I would like to invite my co-chair uh, to present to you uh, 